An anesthetist should have a bag full of multiple skills to be the jack of all trades and also the master of all. This takes us to the next session, jack of all trades. Are you looking to enhance or change your practice? You need some tips? Then be, be seated to your, be glued to your seats to be enlightened by Dr. Raghavendran and doc, Dr. Anshuman Mishra. Sir needs no introduction. Uh, he's very popular because of all the knowledge he shares with us on the group. We also have with us Anshuman Mishra, who's consultant anesthesiologist at JP Hospital. He has special interest in labor analgesia, solid organ transplant, and orthopedics and difficult airway. Hello everyone. It has been a great occasion. Now what I'm going to talk to you is about a uh, few tips and uh, trips in your uh, professional practice. And initially I was uh, a bit reluctant to take it up this uh, topic because I thought someone who's, who can do, talk better and we're doing a better job than me, uh, be selected for that. This is not none other than our, our dear Shivkma Singh, but then somehow he was reluctant to sort of take up any lectures. So finally I had to take up this uh, topic, and uh, I, they gave me about 12 tips to talk to. Then um, in the interest of time, now we thought we'll downsize it about 10 tips. And, uh, and also I requested Dr. Surain to help me with someone else. So we are going to have uh, one more person with me, none other than our dear Hanshuman, who is going to join me in uh, giving, sharing his tips also. So whenever I uh, put my post in uh, the Facebooks, you know, I give a lot of emphasis only on practical things because anyone can uh, uh, read books, there's so much of information available in the, there's so much of information available in the internet nowadays. So uh, you can just um, uh, Google any topic and uh, out comes all the information which you need to. But then acquiring skills is something very different. You need a mentor, okay? You need some senior person to sit with uh, you know, the, the trainees and then he has to tell each and every tip and that is going to make you a very skilled and better anesthesiologist over a period of years. I can take pride of one fact. I may not be a great academician. I never worked in a teaching institution. But I have trained generations of anesthetists. And people whom I have taught, they have outperformed me and they are doing much better than what I am now. And I'm really happy for what they are now and I take real, it's a real uh, a proud moment for me to know that um, they are so-and-so in, in England, so-and-so in UK, and then they are ex ex excellent. And latest one who has sort of got a job is none other than our dear Pooja. And she always remembers me, and I always remember her. And then uh, that's how it goes. You know, it's a typical mentor-mentor relationships. 
And uh, I feel that I have given her a lot and I think she's going to be very successful in uh, Australia, uh, wherever she goes in future. The same goes for other students also. Okay, so I think we're getting things ready now. Right, I'm going to uh, say, we're going to take about three minutes for each tip and all. So please bear with me if I'm not that impressive as my writing skills. And I'm that used to presentations anyway. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about propofol. It's just not propofol per se, but the use of propofol with other maneuvers, which is going to make the atmosphere of propofol a little bit more uh, uh, safe. Now let's take a patient. Let us take a patient who is a, a claustrophobic in MRA room. He goes into the MR room, he comes out screaming. He says, well, I can't go inside. Okay, now, what is uh, preventing him from going inside? It is, it's a sensory input. Okay, he just gets inside and then uh, he gets scared because of a closed space. Okay, first and foremost, remove the sensory input which is causing distress. So, induce the patient first thing outside the MR room. Don't uh, take him inside the MR room first. Cover his eyes, remove all sensory input, plug his ears and get an IV line. And give, you have to give some sedation definitely. Okay, midazolam for my propofol in smaller doses is essential once you remove the sensory input and once he's fully set only, you take, transport him on a MR compatible trolley, take him to the MR room and there you can continue uh, the sedation. Don't stop it because once you stop it and makes it the middle of the thing, he is going to feel very terrified and again come out screaming. Okay, again it's a common scenario, a child who is terrified in my room, so you have to ensure an adequate um, pre-medication so the child comes sleep sleepy. So don't compromise on safety, have all the equipment ready. IV line after intravenous induction is quite uh, essential, otherwise they won't cooperate. Metazolome in appropriate doses followed by propofol infusions. So what I'll give formula, multiply body weight by 6. Suppose the child is about 10 kg, multiply by 6, it comes to about 60 milligrams. That means if you give 6 ml per hour, that should be enough. And that comes to about 100 mg per kg per hour. And then you can use a long extension tube um, uh, connected to the uh, uh, IV line from a syringe pump, which may or may not be modified MRI. So I've been doing it for without unmodified uh, syringe pumps. It works quite well. Okay, now next scenario is the propofol endoscopy rooms. Here, Again, same things are giving, but then once endoscopist puts a scope inside, the patient is going to gag, and then you're going to read a more uh, dose of propofol. So what you do in such circumstances, remove the, uh, the stimulus. So ask the patient to gargle with about 10 ml or 4% topical. Don't use sprays. Use only topical. Ask him to keep it, gargle it, and then keep it for a minute and then swallow it. Then you give a smaller dose of propofol. That should be enough. Okay, because if we give higher doses, the patient will again go for some uh, problems. Now again, you go for, uh, say, drug-induced endoscopy, more and more uh, indecisions are asking for it. So drug-induced sleeping endoscopy is a very scary situation. You are going outside the theater, facilities may not be up to your uh, expectations. So get SOAPME. SOAPME stands for suction, oxygen, airway, pharmacy, and monitoring equipment. Ensure this before you touch a patient, okay? And then make sure that you got all the monitoring equipment. And again, same thing, I'll ask the patient to gargle 4% xylocaine, 10 ml, pack both nostrils with cotton soaked in 4% uh, xylocaine. And after the fiber optic bronchus inserted, then you give metazolone plus titrated doses. See, what, why you are doing this is you can give just about 5 to 6 ml, you can achieve uh, very good conditions. See, what you want to see is how the structures collapse during uh, drug induced sleep. And that's what is essential. Otherwise, you may have to give more than, say, about 10, 15 ml, and that will cause apnea and desaturation, and you have obese patient, who you have a situation. So, there is airway compromise, and then you Okay, next topic. I'm the youngest, probably, in this group to give the tips and tricks, because I am the only one who is getting all those knowledges. But then when sir asked me, it's a, it was easy, and it's also a difficult task. Easy because Raghavendram sir makes it so easy everything, you feel, yes, you can also sail through. Difficult because it sets the standard so high, it becomes difficult to reach up to. So mine will be, uh, I am only talking about four tips and these tips or tricks, whatever, 
this uh, I have learned something, I have uh, listened something, I have uh, uh, found out something and I am just sharing with you. Two will be videos and two will be PPTs. Uh, if you want any problem, you have an issue with the videos, we can discuss with them later on. Thank you. The first one would be how to find the authenticity of ABG in the bedside. Uh, issue is that when you get a patient in the trauma and uh, the patient comes in emergency room, you don't have a uh, palpable pulse and you take a blood gas analysis and take the sample and you get the sample done. So you get this sample. So you have an arterial blood and um, when you compare the arterial blood and mixed venous blood supply, you should not throw away the mixed venous supply if sample if you have got because it can give you a lot of data about this patient also. It only has some difference in the PaO2 value and the oxygen saturation. Rest of the values, it can give you loads of information about the patient's status, condition, and what you need to do with this patient. Issue is that how do you do it in a bedside? How do you find the authenticity of the ABG? So what we do is that to find the authenticity, you need to have the H, calculate the H plus ion in the arterial blood gas sample. Usually, we have this uh, equation 24 into PCO2 by bicarbs. So you need to calculate this. Second option is this young, uh, this person, Burden et al, made it a lot easy. They say minus the last two digit of the pH from figure 80. Suppose it is 42 as in this example, you minus that 42. So we have an example, I have tried this out sampling this, I have done this, if you can try it out also your place also. If the pH is 7.42 and the PCO2 is 30.8 and bicarb 19.3, H plus is 38.1. So you know minus the 0.42, that 42 from 80, you are getting a figure of 38. That's pretty near. So in the, in the bedside only, you can find out whether the ABG sample is authentic or not. That's as simple as that. First one is done. Thank you. Sir. OK. On to the next one. So uh, sometimes we really, you know, uh, even after a very faultless uh, technique uh, of you know, either, either PNS guided or ultrasound guided nerve block, some segments escape and the surgeon is able to cut the patient, patient jerks and the surgeon looks up to you, uh, looks at you and then see what's happening. So what do you do in the such circumstances? So you can convert to GA to save for the emperasmate, you can give uh, distal nerve blocks that involve some delay or you can give local, ask the local, ask surgeon to give an um, uh, infiltration. Okay, now we are embarked on one technique which I've been using it for more than about say 12 to 15 years now. By accident, I found this technique. It's a utilization of an age old BS block with, combined with a um, brachial plexus block. This is for upper limb, but you can use it for lower limb also. So, useful when tunicase is employed, got a predictable onset, bloodless field because of the presence of tunicase and uh, the uh, Analgesia continues, even to any case release, block is 100% effective. What is the hallmark of this technique is a prolonged postoperative analgesia of 24 hours. And we can, can combine this technique to that of a CAC, combined spinal of the lumbar uh, lower limbs. And you can use, for, as I told you, for both upper and lower limbs now. So what do you do here? You, you take an IV line on the other side, the non-operative side. After you get an IV line, uh, then do a uh, brachial plexus block, either uh, ultrasound guided or uh, PNS guided, uh, suitable location, supra or infra clavicular. Then after that, you take an IV line on the operation side, and then elevate the limb, exsanguinate the limb, and once you get a full exsanguination of the limb, you can inflate the tunicate, and then Take a prepared solution, that is 40 ml of 0.5% lignocaine plain or xylocard and then inject into the vein. Tunicate is already inflated, so it stays in place. So the advantage is that the surgeon can, can uh, once uh, this is injected, he can remove the, uh, the, uh, the vent flaw which is already put in the uh, limb to be operated. Then allow the surgeon to proceed immediately. The, by the time he cleans and drapes the patient, the patient is ready for surgery. And surgical procedure is quite well. Anytime surgeon wants to remove the tunicate, he can do so. Not a problem at all because analgesia is already established with the brachial plexus block. And if you want, you can re re reinsert tunicate also. And any safety issues? Yeah. Only thing is, we have to, uh, as always, a BS block, we have to keep the tunicate in place for a minimum of a half an hour or so. We found it quite safe and effective. Sorry. Um, the analgesia can be well into the post-op period for a prolonged period and 
We have not encountered any failed blocks so far. Uh, the na next tip or trick that we, I'll be saying is uh, about the fiber optic bronchoscope that we are using. And we regularly connect, we have a suction port, and we connect that on the fiber optic bronchoscope to the suctioning port. So what I have done here is that we are actually practicing this thing, and we have used uh, both one suctioning port and one oxygen connection, and connecting it to a three-way. So uh, basically, this is how do. We have a three-way. There is one side is connected to the suction catheter. One side goes to the oxygen uh, port. This one, this one goes to the oxygen port, and this one is connected to the fiber optic bronchoscope. This is one how it have kept it, and now this one is attached to this one. So uh, this is how the whole thing looks like, connected to auxiliary oxygen supply, and this is connected to the bronchoscope. So the good thing is that uh, this is my sin. Lot of time when you do an uh, a, a normal laryngoscopy, you lot of times I have seen during my MD days when I started, there was one professor with us who used to do a laryngoscopy, take the mask down, give a blow it hard, and then put the ET tube. So that is something they used to do it. And I feel also if I have an oxygen port, it makes it very easy. So how it functions is that very simple. You have a three-way connection. You can make it either to let the oxygen go into the patient. When you press that button, suction port on that button on the fiber optic bronchoscope, the oxygen goes from the machine to the patient. And when you want to suction it off, just turn it the other way around. Now, I have a video here where I am putting just the fiber optic bronchoscope in a bottle of water. I haven't put on any gloves because it, I am not doing it on any patient. I was just showing how it needs to be done. But that was the best thing I could do, so I, I couldn't take another video. So let me start. So you can see, you will see it will start giving. Now I've started giving the oxygen and I've started press the button and it, now the oxygen is coming into the patient. Now I'm turning this knob here from oxygen to the suction port. Now this oxygen, this water will go from here and it will come and it will pass on. If you can see clearly, there is some sound. You can feel this, the water goes from here to the suctioning port. This is how it functions. So you have two things. You can give an oxygen to clear the view, give some oxygen insufflation, and yet if you need the suctioning, you can do the suctioning part also. Thank you. This place could be technically very difficult in patients with skeletal anomalies, obese patients, and patients with few spines. So, of course, in children, no, we have to uh, sometimes uh, place, you will not be able to appreciate the, the feel of the ligaments and the needle go just like that. It will be at a very short distance from the uh, skin. So apprehensive patient may not permit you to allow the passage of a needle. They'll keep on moving and jerking, and then uh, they will not give proper posture. And after putting a catheter, there could be play, doubts about the placement of catheter. You're not sure whether you are inside the epidural space at all, because the drug sometimes does not act at all. So what do we do? So we can utilize ultrasound if you have one to estimate the depth and to know the level and the location of interspinal space. See, ultrasound can be utilized very well in not only in adults, but also, uh, and also in children, children with the bones or membranes. Or you can utilize the fluoroscopy to locate the interlaminar space and insertion of needle and the fluoroscopic guiding. Yesterday we had a chronic pain workshop and we all showed how the interlaminar looks so clearly um, uh, seen in the you know, fluoroscopic uh, uh, picture. And you may have to give GA if the patients are apprehensive or definitely in children. And you can approach the epidural space or subarachnoid space from the convex side of a scoliotic curve. Very important because from the, if you go from the convex side, the distance from the skin to the, um, uh, epi the epidural space is shorter. Where, and also you can definitely you can actually move away from the midline and go a little bit paramedian. You will be going to the uh, subarachnoid in a very short time. And other thing is uh, what we found is the identification of epidural space by the hydrostatic or the gravity flow technique. So you can take a pre-op x-ray and then here you can see, even though it's a bamboo spine, no movement at all, you still can see some uh, interlaminar space and that space may be placed to pass in an epidural or spinal needle. Okay, obesity, we have a lot of difficulties filling landmarks. What do we do? Should we abandon the procedure? Well, give it a try with ultrasound guided uh, pro uh, ultrasound uh, uh, procedures, so with the, you can either use it for uh, spinal, epidural, or CSC. We can calculate very clearly the, uh, the skin to the uh, epidural uh, uh, the space depth, and also, you know, at, at where the interspinous space is located now. Okay, this is how you map out all the landmarks. Okay, 
So this is actually a CAC technique which was done using the ultrasound in obese uh, patient. And as I told you, in a patient who is a bit apprehensive, and if you anticipate some difficulty, we can induce a GA. Of course, it's controversy about this uh, uh, induction of GA itself, uh, but you can do it in apprehensive patients, in selected patients, and of course, in children. You can use fluoroscopy. As you can see, there is, uh, you can see that the internal MSP is very clearly seen, and you can uh, pass a needle in, uh, after seeing that interlamina space. This requires a CM anyway, but most of the theaters, especially orthopedic ones, will have a CM facility. Okay, now this is a gravity flow technique, which I found it quite useful in children. I've been using it routinely since 1990, and I've not punctured dura so far with this technique. What you do is, you pass a needle, into the uh, supraspinous, supra interspinous ligament. The skin to the epidural space will be very, uh, not much actually, hardly about one, two centimeters. So once you reach interspinous level, attach a needle to a um, IV giving set, which is uh, connected to a, uh, to a bottle, and open the stop cap, the, the tap. And as the needle enters the epidural space, you see the flow of saline. It's a very uh, reliable technique, and, um, and once you get the epidural space, stop the infusion, then remove that uh, IV giving set and pass the catheter, and it, it can do it very well, actually. Mm. It's not going up. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Mm. Okay, the other one is lunch time, which I wrote in one of my uh, posts, actually, that Injection, uh, mind you, is a small amount, not much. A small amount of distilled water through the epidural catheter, hardly you put about hardly half, not even half, see, a quarter of cc. The moment the, the patient starts saying something is going, it just stop. That's it. It doesn't cause any problem. There's no, new, new, it's not neurotoxic. No. So it causes unpleasant sensation in the back with reflex increase in breathing. This is a dif distinct feeling. It's a described long time ago, but accidentally I when I injected instead of saline. And I found it, this was what occurred, and I started utilizing technique, and I've been using it for uh, quite some time now, and I found it quite reliable. Okay, Anshman next. A uh, fit height person with a weight of 125 kg, and was posted for a pneumonectomy. Uh, now, when you do a pneumonectomy, you put a double lemon tube, and you do the ventilation. So we faced a problem, and uh, we came out of it, and we did something, and I'm just going to show that thing. What happened was that when you put a double lemon tube, when the ventilator, both lungs are ventilating, it's very nice. When you clamp the bronchial part and you are only ventilating through one part and you want to give some support to that bronchus part, or you clamp the tracheal part, you only want to ventilate the bronchus part. How do you maintain the double ventilation with a support in a single machine? How do you do that? So what we did was that uh, we made an uh, stopgap arrangement for how to, for this, uh, this contraption. What we did was that okay, this one is the right one is the tracheal one and the left one is the bronchial one. So the bronchial one is clamped and the, this one is open and through that we inserted a 14 gauge suction catheter. Now, uh, it's not coming, fine. So now what we do is we get the suction catheter is connected, the, ed, the end, that green part is cut and is connected to a three way. This is the oxygen which is coming from the auxiliary unit and this is connected to an IV set. And this IV set is the end part, the part portion which doesn't have the, the chamber is cut and that is put inside this one liter bottle, water bottle. And uh, this is, goes inside the water. Uh, here I have just put a scale which measures the level of water. Suppose I want to give a pressure support of six centimeter of water. So I fill it up with six centimeter of water. This tube goes inside. So when I open, this connection is connected, and when you start the flow, once the bubbles come out through this one, then I know at least a pressure of six centimeter of water is going into this bronchus. And this is the arrangement that we did in the top part. There is a flap, and this tube goes in, and there is a cut in the tube bottle where the air has to come out from that one. And this is the video. I am just showing for the same thing, showing that we have connected this one and this goes inside and this water bubble is coming out and it is fixed at six centimeter. So if you can see 
that it is fixed at 6 cm and that is the pressure that I want to give. We can decrease or increase the pressure support based on the amount of water I put in that bottle. So it's a stop, we don't need any gadgetry, any strong big instruments to deliver that much of pressure support. And this is another person thing of the same thing. What I did was a positive pressure I was giving. This is a negative suction. A lot of time you have a thoracotomy patient with a chest strain, with a sustained amount of fixed amount of pressure suctioning. So what we do is that okay, we connect this. This is connected to the patient side. Then this connected to another one, connected to this one. And this is connected to the pressure support. And it has a pressure, the water level. So when you uh, do this, it will give exactly that much of pressure onto this will give the pressure to onto this and that will be connected from the patient. So you can get a fixed amount of pressure support back from the patient. Thank you. Okay. Now, Arjuna lost his life. So, same, I feel very um, tense now whenever I, if I don't have an IV line or an airway. Okay. So, getting an IV line could be a very difficult at times. And without IV line, patient is so vulnerable. Okay, it could be very uh, uh, distressing um, uh, for the child who is terrified of uh, um, an IV line, um, uh, uh, IV injections, especially if they had a prior uh, bad uh, experience. So what all we can do? So get a good train system. More first and foremost, we have to have a good light source. Keep different size cannulas. Don't keep on running at the time when you can't get already used up one or two, uh, two cannulas. At that time, if you search for that, it could be very distressing, not only for you, but also for the patient. You can judiciously apply EMLA cream over the intended puncture site 60 to 90 minutes before the venipuncture. The time is important, actually. And you have to ensure the child comes very calm and quiet, which can result in a smooth induction and also uh, a venipuncture. You may have the help of parents nearby. And uh, usually the EJVs or uh, wrist veins are not much attacked, usually not attacked by the nurses. So in that case, you can place them very well. Vein finders are useful at times. And what I found was, uh, see, uh, once you make a puncture with a venflon, the venflon tip goes off. So subsequent uh, punctures will uh, make it blunt and it may be difficult. So what I found was that usually you make a puncture with the metal na needle first. After that, you try with the cannula and then you can enter the vein very easily. Okay, ultrasound is definitely helpful, especially for kids. I don't think I want to start a, uh, a, a, a pediatric long case or major case without an ultrasound nowadays. And... Um, for IJVs, femoral line cannulations is invaluable. Now what I want to tell about these things, the tip which I want to give is that don't use a needle for uh, puncturing the IJV, use a cannula. Okay, once a cannula goes into the uh, vein, remove the stillet, then pass a short distance the cannula inside. Subsequent passage of the guido is quite easy and that makes it atraumatic and quite successful. So, we have situation in emergency room, a child comes, degraded state, you can't get any line, they call the anesthetist. And you go there, child is collapsed now. What else can you do? Sometimes in the initial resuscitation, when nothing else is available, go for an intraoceous route. This is available in India nowadays. The, uh, the needle costs about nearly three or 4,000 rupees. The gun is about uh, 18,000 rupees. It's a one-time purchase. Comes for quite some time. And you can get an uh, access to an, um, an intra access to the the uh, the um, uh, IV access. You can get with this in a matter of just few minutes. So it comes with a come with a connector which can be attached to the giving set, and you can give a drugs, and it can uh, can be easily done when there is no venous access. Helps in resuscitation also. We can keep up to two, 24 hours. That gives ample time to get a permanent line. And we can, the, the accessible sites include uh, the tibia, the proximal humerus, and the distal femur, and, and tibia. OK, now, so far I've been giving some practical tips. Now, a little bit beyond that, about anesthesia per se itself, general guidelines now. A patient, when it comes to you, 
the PEC clinic, they're going, not going to ask about how you're going to endure. They're going to ask you one thing. Doctor, when will I get up? So you have to ensure that the patient gets up well with, with the uh, good uh, by, um, uh, reflexes and all, okay? So what I do, see, the thing is, the, the opinions may differ. This is my technique, and then you can, it's all, you can discuss about this uh, various uh, techniques as such. And then I put off propofol if I'm using infusion at least 30 minutes before the planned wake-up call. Cut off the inhalation agent if you're using it 5-10 minutes before the patient can be aroused. And then we have to wait till the internal concentration comes to about less than 0.2%. Unless there's a contraindication, I prefer to use nitrous oxide, which permits a lesser concentration of inhalation agents. Use narcotics sparingly. I don't go beyond one mix per kg. And every hourly, I give one, one mix per kg. And stop at least 30 minutes prior. And I do use liquid spray, especially for some uh, ENT operations and all, where you want to prevent the violent coughing at the end. And judicious use of muscle relaxants in titrated doses and in infusion for long cases. Stop infusion at least 15 minutes prior. Supplement with nerve blocks or uh, neuroaxial blocks or interfacial blocks. And then whenever possible, we use LMAs or MMA, which ensures a smooth recovery. And I've been using uh, this MMA after my interaction in the task, much more than what was before. And important to monitor temperature because hypothermia is a cause for delay. And most important, anesthetists should remain in the room till the patient has got a full recovery. Never leave the room. Don't give a technician to walk off because the, that's a time when the patient is most vulnerable and then they desaturate and they go to the, PS, uh, go to the PACU, the nurse, the urgent call that patient not breathing and desaturating and all. So you have one, if the patient asks unbelievingly, doctor, is the operation over? Or if the nurse, the recovery nurse asks you, did the patient receive GA? Now, Anton, she wants to give some few. Yeah, and this is basically the, what is the ABC of anesthetist? This is not the ABC of anesthesia, this is ABC of anesthetist. And that, I believe, is always be cool. You are called so many places, you are given so many different assignments, so many different times, so many different situations, and with so many different support staff who keep on changing. The shift changes, you have a different staff, and you do not know you have a compatibility with some staff, you do not have the compatibility with the other one. So issue is that, okay, how do you take care of that one? How do you manage? How do you recharge yourself? You are not a power bank. You need to have some sink to throw something out. This, talk, this thing is uh, re remotely uh, related to what uh, Vijit sir will be speaking. He will be speaking in a broader term. But I am just going to give a simple tip to for some persons who are coming new to the anesthesia fraternity because this is the, it's the least used subject in the MBBS curriculum when you speak up, take up the anesthesia, you have got hardly any clue what I am doing, why I am doing and how I am doing. So what I follow is, I always follow this. I call this the cycle of life. If you inculcate this habit of doing a cycle of life, so what is basically a cycle of life? You start with the patient. The patient is your main goal. From the patient, the patient is op getting operated here, you are standing here, you start with the patient. You see the patient is there, stable, the position is okay. The patient is not slipping off, the hand is okay, the every uh, pressure points are taken care of, the eye is covered. If you have any issues in that one, the warmer is working, the DVD pump is functioning, everything is there. Then you come to the tubes. Tubes is endotracheal tubes, you have the Riles tube, you have the urinary catheter, you have the IV cannulas and the flow, you have the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the pumps the supplying anything, any tube, whatever the tubes is, that is connected and that is functioning. Then you come to the ventilator, how the ventilator is behaving, whether the compliance is okay, the tidal volume is being delivered, the MAC is okay, the patient is comfortable, everything. Then you come to the monitor, it will show you the values, what is about the patient. And then you go back to the anesthetist, that is very important. Are you hungry? Do you want to have a cup of tea? Want to go to the loo? That's very important. If you have a long, long surgery, it matters much. You start at 8, by night in the 8, you feel already drained. Then you know you have to run another 6 hours. So how do you manage that one? So why I do that? If you do this and then you come back again to the patient. So if you start doing this every 10 minutes, trust me, it takes less than 10 seconds. And you, for the next 10 minutes, you are set for a patient who you know is safe in your hand. Thank you. Become an outstanding anesthetist. It's not about the professional, I mean, uh, the practice as such, but then you are, uh, how you behave. Okay. 
So be smarter than the anesthesiologists. Keep up with the latest developments. And really, TAS is really helping us. And every day, we sign a lot of knowledge uh, we are gaining. And then project yourself by interacting. I started projecting myself and started interacting only after I became a member of TAS. Thank you so much. So be prepared. Always, you have a plan. Plan your technique. Explain the complications. Be ready with the agents and airway equipment. Be prepared. Don't start a case unless you have these things. However, maybe the urgency. Okay, at least few minutes, two or three minutes you must take to sort of at least do the basic uh, you know, tests on each equipment, prepare the drugs, and then, then only start it. Be friendly and personable. So you should not become brash and moody. It is very easy to give advice, but uh, I don't know whether I'm following it. Sometimes I <laughs> So they should look forward to working with you, especially if surgeons who are, who are not so amenable. And learn to wake up. I already gave you some, uh, uh, some tips on that, actually. How to wake up your patient promptly and without pain. Learn to perform procedures at the highest level. So for that, you must go and attend various conferences, workshop, workshops, because every day there's a new things developing. So keep on updating yourself. Learn, unlearn, keep on doing it. And that's how you keep up and establish proper repo with the patient pre-op. And then the idea of PAC is not only to see the patient, but then instill the confidence in the patient that you're going to be uh, uh, helping the patient. And the patient should ask you at the end, doctor, will you be coming for this operation for, for, for this uh, anesthesia for me? In that case, that means you have done a good job. Avoid letting surgeons to boss you around. Okay. Um, see, why I'm saying this is um, sometimes they want to choose a technique which you may not like to uh, do. See, there's contraindication of spinal patients got a uh, back surgery done and then they keep on telling, no, 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 uh, please do only spinal, I'm okay with that. Then you should have the guts and courage to say that, look, I can't do it. I'm going to choose a GA for this patient. Okay, most important value in theater is to care for the patient in a safe manner. What is safe, what you feel safe, that you must follow. And cultivate your read, speaking and writing skills. I, th I don't think uh, I have that much anyway, but I want you to inculcate that habit. They take part in scientific meetings, conferences, and administrative meetings. And then avoid being a locker slammer. So this is a term which means that at the end of the day, you just, when you wind up, you just go, Take all it, um, open your locker, take out all your things, slam the locker shut, and just go home without talking to anybody. So this locker my attitude, it should not be there. So just go and uh, meet your people, uh, your, your patients, and say hello to them, and talk to your relatives, and that's going to create an image about you, and uh, you can really become quite popular with this attitude, actually. And trust your gut and choose a line of work which you love. If you love what you do, you will not work a single day in your life. That's important. So choose a line which is giving you pleasure. For example, if, you're, if something is stressing you, say pediatric anesthesia is not your cup of tea, don't go near the children. Or keep on going till such time you become confident. Okay? And avoid complaining of long days and short days. When you're working long days, I know that you'll be tired. Don't think about your programs at home. Do you remember that long days are the ones which are monetarily very rewarding for you. And uh, you know how to manage the patients not well. And then that will give you a very good uh, uh, feeling that you manage the case very successfully. And short days are the ones when you can take a rest and turn your attention to something else. Go and spend time with your family. Go for some movie or read some books. Understand, sorry, uh, understand the economics of anesthesia. I never understood this at all. And especially the billing and the reimbursement part. So a lot of money is still pending, actually, you know. So, okay, with the institution where I worked earlier. So, and then, um, you know, talk to your employees and then uh, have strike a deal. If you think that you are capable, you must get what you deserve, okay? You deserve more, more than what you're getting. Then don't afraid to talk it out. And then move on if it's not, uh, you're not happy with that, uh, you know, what arrangements you're having, okay? So there's a saying, you know, the gurus will tell the students, do what I say, but don't do what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Anshuman. Your tips will definitely help us refine our skills and practice. Sir, before we...
Before we go to the next uh, thing, in the meantime, the last bit, what Dr. Raghavendran said, I think it is from his heart. Because he didn't say what he's not practicing. The last bit is he's been practicing for the 20 years and I'm a witness for 14 years. So even the place before used to be like that and this place also is like that. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.